Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm Rebecca King. I'm on the board of the Hypersomnia Foundation, and I'm very excited to host today's program on reducing your out-of-pocket costs for pre prescription medication and appealing insurance denials. This is such an important topic for our community, as most people with hypersomnia will need the care of a sleep specialist and need to take medications for the rest of their lives. For those of us living in the US, our complex and ever-changing system of insurance makes it even more challenging to consistently access medications at prices that we can afford. A few weeks ago, the Hypersomnia Foundation launched new web pages on the topics of insurance and disability. Much of the information on the insurance web pages came from you, members of our community who shared their experiences finding the best price for medications or appealing insurance company denials. While today's webinar will highlight just a few strategies for accessing medications, I highly recommend that everyone watching this webinar go to our website and become familiar with all of the resources and strategies available. From the Hypersomnia Foundation homepage, you click on resources, then disability and insurance. So if you're scrambling to find a pen right now, I'll say it again. From the Hypersomnia Foundation homepage, look towards the top right to click on resources, then choose disability and insurance from the drop down list. Before we bring on our first speaker, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Avidel Pharmaceuticals, Harmony Biosciences, Jazz Pharmaceuticals, Takeda Pharmaceutical Company, and Orexia Therapeutics. Their support helps make this program possible and allows us to offer it as a free event. I also need to add this disclaimer, the Hypersomnia Foundation does not endorse any medication or treatments and does not provide any medical advice either during this presentation or on our website. Please talk to your own medical provider about your personal health needs and concerns. And now I'd like to introduce our first presenter. Carla Della Porta is the Director of User Engagement at NeedyMeds. Her professional background has been entirely dedicated to nonprofit organizations from New York City to Cape Ann, Massachusetts. In her role, she educates people about needy meds and the healthcare savings and educational resources offered, expands partnership efforts, and works to improve the experience of those that turn to needy meds for assistance. So Carla, welcome, and now I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for that warm intro introduction and hello everyone. I am so pleased to join you today for this really important conversation. Um, and as you just heard, my name is Carla and I'm the Director of User Engagement at an organization called Needy Meds. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how to find healthcare savings, including but not limited to medications through Needy Meds. So today I'm going to talk to you about importantly, what is needy meds, what healthcare savings resources are available. I'll talk to you about the needy meds drug discount card, another way to save on healthcare expenses, and I'll offer some really easy ways to stay in touch with us. So for those of you not familiar with needy meds, needy meds is a national nonprofit co-founded more than two decades ago by a retired family physician, Dr. Rich Sagal, and his friend, Libby Overly, who is actually a medical social worker. And what you're seeing on the screen is our formal wording for our mission statement, a statement about how we achieved that mission, and our vision statement. But simply put, Needy Meds connects people to programs that will help them afford their healthcare expenses. And we do that free and anonymously through a helpline, 1-800-503-6897, and our website, needymeds.org. And again, I will provide that information towards the end of the presentation as well. So what I'd like to talk to you about is how do you go ahead and find healthcare savings on needymeds.org. And one thing I really want to stress is the point of this presentation is not for you to become an expert on needymeds.org. It's simply for you to remember that Needy Meds is here to offer support if you're having trouble affording those healthcare costs. So 
To begin by finding healthcare savings, you go to needymeds.org and you click on that healthcare savings tab. And when you do that, all of these different categories will pop up. And that will include prescription assistance programs, our category, category for $4 generic discount drug programs, a free low cost and sliding scale clinics category, coupons, rebates, and more. Diagnosis information pages, and right underneath that, diagnosis-based assistance programs. We do have a COVID-19 resource center. You can also find help affording medical transportation costs, retreats, camps, recreational programs, and educational scholarships as well as government programs where you can find cost savings programs in your state. And at the very bottom, you will also see a link to that Needy Meds drug discount card, which we'll talk about later on in, that present, in the presentation. Now, this is a lot of information under this healthcare savings tab. So what I'd like to do is take a moment to talk about what each of these categories are. So let's get started with right at the top, you will see those prescription, uh, that link for prescription assistance programs. And those are programs that are usually supported by pharmaceutical companies and most of the time offer free and some of the time offer deeply discounted prescription drugs, usually name brand to those that qualify. Basically, if you're looking for help affording a brand name medication, you'll wanna start your search there. Now, right underneath there, you will find the $4 generic discount drug program. No surprise that this section is a great resource for finding generic medications, as opposed to, to name brand medications, at a discounted price. And it's worth checking out because you may even find your prescription um, here at a price lower than your insurance company. Now, that's not often, but sometimes, so it's worth checking it out. Now, if you, your loved ones, your patients or clients are in need of a, an affordable primary care physician, check out that free low cost and sliding scale clinics. That's another popular destination on needymeds.org. That category is actually broken down into four subsections to make your search easier. You can find medical clinics, dental clinics, substance abuse clinics, as well as mental health clinics. So do check those out. There are actually more than, let's see, more than about 18,000 clinics included in that category as of today. Underneath that, you'll find our coupons, rebates, and more, where you can be connected to discounted over-the-counter meds, prescription drugs, and medical supplies with the quick click of your mouse. There is a, a little space on this list for a reason, and we'll get to that moment momentarily. But under that coupons, rebates, and more section, oh, excuse me, not, it's actually not quite under it. When you click on that healthcare savings tab in the second, in the middle section at the top, you will find those diagnosis-based assistance programs. Now, for the most part, this section does not include cost savings for medications. What it does include instead are other medical expenses. Excuse me, what it does include instead are other, <clears throat> other ways to save on medical expenses relating to a particular diagnosis. For example, maybe somebody needs help affording durable medical equipment. Maybe they need money to take time off for respite care. Maybe they need living expenses while receiving treatment. Maybe they need access to a service animal. So basically anything that doesn't fall neatly under that category of medications, but you need help affording anyway because it's related to your diagnosis, you'll go ahead and check out that diagnosis-based assistance programs. So I do have a, a very specific question coming in with someone sharing that they do have a government subsidized insurance military plan and they wanna know if they can use any of these pro programs. As this individual understands it, they can't use any prescription plans and subsidized programs for medication. 
So here's the tricky thing about that. And the question, I, I hate to give this answer because the answer is it depends. So what I mean by that is prescription assistance programs will have their own eligibility section. $4 generic drug discount programs will let you know if there's any disclaimers. That will also be true for coupons, rebates, and more listings, as well as those diagnosis-based assistance programs. I can say that oftentimes, many of these programs can either not be combined with an already existing insurance, or they are only people that can apply or must be without insurance, but that's not always the case. So I wanna stress it's worth checking out. The other thing that this gives me an opportunity to mention is that one thing we have seen in the past year and a half because of the pandemic and so many people having trouble affording their healthcare expenses, a lot of the eligibility sections or requirements of these different programs have expanded. So programs that had very strict eligibility requirements have really loosened up because they understand what a need is out there. So the answer is it depends. And what I would stress is check out all of these different healthcare savings resources under that healthcare savings tab on needymeds.org. And please don't hesitate to reach out to our call center counselors. They are there to help and answer these particular questions for you. They're available Monday through Friday, Eastern time because we're in Massachusetts. And we also have um, Spanish speaking counselors. So I will provide that contact information at the end. Thanks so much for um, asking that though. So getting back to these other healthcare savings resources, we just talked about diagnosis-based assistance programs. And underneath that, you will find our COVID-19 Resource Center. It's a destination that we're, it's sort of sad that we had to create it, but we were happy to provide financial assistance and help for those that need assistance affording their healthcare expenses because they have been affected by the pandemic. So keep checking, also refer to that COVID-19 Resource Center because that's an example of programs that offer pretty, um, pretty broad eligibility guidelines. So now if you're moving down that center section under the healthcare savings tab, as I said, you can also find help affording medically trans transportation expenses. Oftentimes getting back and forth from a doctor or specialized facility can cause its own financial burden or so we've been told by many needy meds users, which is why we added that medical transportation cost assistance section. At the very top of the third com column under that healthcare savings tab, you will find help affording retreats, camps, recreational programs, and educational scholarships for those living with a particular diagnosis. And at the very bottom on the right-hand side, you will find our government program section. And I think that's worth checking out because that's a section that's important because it will show you all government funded healthcare savings options in your state. Now, as I said a little bit ago, you'll notice there's a space in between this list on your screen right now, and that's purposeful. Um, that's because one thing that I did want to take an opportunity to showcase, showcase is those diagnosis-based, uh, excuse me, diagnosis information pages. Now, under that healthcare savings tab, right at the top, right above those diagnosis-based assistance programs, you will find our diagnosis information pages. Now with these pages, we partner with other reputable nonprofits to provide educational information and healthcare savings for those living with a particular diagnosis. And I am super proud to let you know that we have partnered with the Hypersomnia Foundation to offer the idiopathic hypersomnia diagnosis information page. And this is what the top of that page looks like you'll find their logo and a link to their site. They've provided us with some information and text to talk about what IH is and some information about that diagnosis. On the right-hand side, you will find reputable resources. 
And at the very bottom of this page, you will find a list of medications commonly used in the treatment of this diagnosis. And all of those medications are actually hyperlinked. So what that means is if you're looking for help affording one of these medications, you simply click on it and it will let you know if there is a healthcare savings program available. And I really do wanna stress, as you can see at the bottom, it says that it lets you know when the page was last updated. That's important because you know we're staying in touch with our partners to keep it accurate and up to date, but also because programs for medications to help you save on their costs change all the time. I'm stressing that because if you don't find a healthcare savings program for a particular medication today, check back again because there may be one now. You never know. So let's move on and talk about another way to save, which is with the Needy Meds drug discount card. So I'm sure you've heard of drug discount cards, which is again a way to save on your medications and healthcare costs. You simply bring your card which can be a plastic form, like a credit card, like the one looking at your screen on your screen. It could be a paper form, or it can be an app. And the Needy Meds drug discount card can be downloaded for free through Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Now you simply take this card in whatever format you have it, paper, plastic, or an app, to the pharmacy and save. Now, I'm sure you've heard that there's other drug discount cards out there. The Needy Meds drug discount card, however, is both free and anonymous. Confidentiality is absolutely guaranteed. There is no registration, no enrollment, no residency requirements, no activation, and it is accepted at more than 65,000 pharmacies nationwide. With the drug discount card, you can save up to 80% on prescription medications. You can save on over-the-counter medications and supplies, as long as they're written as prescriptions. And you can even to save, use it to save on human equivalent pet meds. The drug discount card can also be used to save about 40% of medical equipment. So the big question everybody asks is, who can use the drug discount card? And the simple answer is anyone. The only rule is it cannot be combined with insurance. So if you don't have insurance, you can use the card anytime. If you do have insurance, you may choose to use the drug disc card instead. And you may choose to do that, for example, if you find your medication isn't covered under your particular insurance, maybe your copayment is too high, maybe your deductible is too high. Maybe you find yourself in a coverage gap, or maybe you've exceeded a cap for drug coverage for the year. So let's talk about how you can get your Needy Meds drug discount card. Now you may remember under that healthcare savings tab on the bottom right, there was a link to the Needy Meds drug discount card. And if you simply go to needymeds.org on the left-hand side, you will also see a box with a red arrow that says, get your Needy Meds drug discount card. They will both take you to the same page, which is the Needy Meds drug discount card page. And this is where you can print out the downloadable PDF. You saw a screenshot of that earlier. Don't forget, you can download it for free as an app through Google Play or the iTunes App Store. You can request a plastic card be mailed to you, and you even get to pick out your own design. You can always mail us a self-addressed stamped envelope. You can find our mailing address on our website, and you can also reach out to our call center counselors, and they'll be happy to drop one or a few in the mail for you. Now, before I move on, and don't forget, before I jump to the next slide, if you do have any questions, don't hesitate to type that into that Q&A section, um, and I'll be happy to address them. In the meantime, I will jump ahead now because I promised you some easy ways to stay in touch with Needy Meds. Now, on the right-hand side of our homepage, you will find a bunch of icons. That's where you can find all of our social media icons. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can find us on LinkedIn. I recommend also subscribing to our blog. We have a really talented writer, my colleague Evan, who really provides thoughtly and provocative pieces on healthcare topics. We do have a Pinterest page still, and you can also follow us on Instagram. 
Now, we spent all of this presentation talking about that healthcare savings tab, but right next to that, you will find the education tab. And when you click on that, these categories will pop up. And this is, uh, this is a great section if you want to um, order some of our print materials, such as our drug discount cards or most popular brochures. You can even print out most of our most popular brochures in electronic versions. They're listed right at the bottom. You can find our upcoming webinars and sign up for our monthly newsletter in that center section under, under education. So when time allows, in addition to further browsing that healthcare savings tab, don't forget to check out that education tab right next to it. As promised, I wanted to leave up contact information. If you're interested in ordering bulk supplies of our drug discount cards and hard copies of our brochures, you could reach out to my friend and colleague, Alana. These brochures aren't helping anybody sitting on our shelf, so we're happy to get them in the mail for you. If you have any questions regarding today's presentation or you're joining us from um, another organization and you have questions about partnering with NeedyMeds, don't hesitate to reach out to me. And as promised, there's our helpline on the bottom left and please visit needymeds.org. Thank you so much. And I do see another question coming in, which is actually a question we get pretty often, which is how is needy meds funded? Great question. So you can find a more detailed answer to this question if you go to needymeds.org. On the top right-hand side, you'll see our About Us. And under there, I believe it's Needy Med's History or Needy Med's Mission. On that page, you will find basically the answer I'm about to give you, which is Needy, Med, Needy Med's relies on about six or seven sources of support. First of all, we are a nonprofit organization, so we do rely on grants, individual and corporate donations. We do get um, a, an, a transition, a transaction fee every time our drug discount card is used. We actually created a software called Pap Tracker that we sell, which eliminates the administrative burden of manually submitting and tracking prescription assistance programs. We have thoroughly vetted um, paid sponsorship on our website, which we're super careful about. So check out um, our excuse me, our homepage so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, and there's a couple of other sources of income that we re rely on, such as we will do, um, we will license some of our data out to partnering organizations, and we will create a call center if there's an, um, if a company interested in offering a prescription assistance program. So we can help with that administrative portion of prescription assistance programs. But if I wasn't thorough enough, please, again, you can find that information on needymeds.org, the top right-hand side, about us. And again, click on Needy Meds Mission under there, and you'll see those few sources of support that we rely on. But thanks so much for asking that and give me a chance to provide what I hope was a thorough answer. So as I said, I don't see any other questions coming in, but please hang on to my email if anything pops into your mind after, the, after today's presentation. And don't hesitate to reach out to our call center counselors and please visit needymeds.org to see how we can help you. Thanks so much. So Carla, before you go, I, I have a question too. Sure. <laughs> I think, um, within the list of medications commonly used for hypersomnia, some of them can be quite expensive. Mm. And the pharmaceutical companies do offer patient assistance programs. That's right. So I know that your site um, has information on a bunch of these programs, but I think it would be great if you could just explain the basics of these pharmaceutical company sponsored programs and how they work. Sure, absolutely. I'm, ha I'm really happy to, and thanks for that question. So one thing I also want to say that if anybody is interested in learning more about Needy Meds, we offer monthly overview webinars that is just goes a little bit more into detail about basically everything I covered today. But we also offer webinars and videos that do deep dives in into particular healthcare cost savings resources. So we do have about a 15 minute webinar on 
all about prescription assistance programs, that it does a deep dive into how they work and how they can help. We offer them on diagnosis-based assistance programs. So check out our YouTube channel as well as our upcoming webinar page. However, getting back to the question, prescription assistance programs, and actually the, the right way to refer to them is patient assistance programs or PAPs, are programs that are usually supported by pharmaceutical companies and most of the time offer free and some of the time offer deeply discounted prescription drugs, usually name brand to those that qualify. So when I started working at Needy Meds, that was the definition I was given. And I'll be honest with you, that definition still didn't mean anything to me. So I'm going to explain to you the way I understood it. Sometimes if you're watching TV and you see a, an advertisement for a name brand medication, or you're listening to the radio and you hear an advertisement for a name brand medication, very quickly, there'll be a disclaimer that says, if you're having trouble affording your medication, AstraZeneca may be able to help. That is an assist, a patient assistance program. So what that means is, and what you will find on our website, it means that pharmaceutical company, because they know that their medications are expensive, what they have decided to do is they have decided to make it more accessible to people that don't have insurance, are underinsured, or simply can't afford that medication. So what that means, they put together a program. And what that usually looks like is there's some sort of an application which you have to complete and submit to the patient assistance program. Usually you will have to fill out details like the name of the medication, the dosage, the day supply. Sometimes you can, the patient can fill it out. Sometimes the doctor has to fill it out. At the very least, it will always require a doctor's signature. Once that application is complete, you submit it to the prescription assist, patient assistance program directly. Now, here's the thing about needy meds that makes this really easy. You will be taken, let's, let's say you find a brand name medication that does have a patient assistance program. You click on that and it will take you to the patient assistance program page. And to make this easy for our users, at the very top of the page, you will find the name of the business or pharmaceutical company that's offering the program. You will find their contact information, which usually includes an 800 number. So if you have questions about what the program offers or how to apply, you can reach out to them. And then super important, you will not only find the application and where and how to submit it, but you will also find the eligibility requirements section. So you can simply click on this link and get a snapshot in real time of whether or not you will be able to apply because you'll be looking at the eligibility requirements right on your screen. And the eligibility requirements, although they do vary from drug to drug and from program to program, they're almost always based on insurance coverage, income status, and residency. Now, one thing I want to stress, we had a question about this earlier, is the eligibility. And I will say that oftentimes, patient assistance programs are for people that don't have insurance at all, but that has changed a lot. So we are finding that if you do have insurance, turn to Needy Meds and check out those patient assistance programs anyway, because you may be eligible. And here's the other thing that we tell you. If you're not, if you don't technically fall within those eligibility guidelines, we recommend applying anyway and asking the patient assistance program for something called an economic hardship exception. If you are still denied, you can always appeal. But we say just apply. What's the worst that can happen? You say no. And if you have any questions about cost savings programs, reach out to our call center counselors because we all know sometimes it's simply easier to speak with a person. And we do have the contact information for the patient assistance programs. So any questions about those, reach out to them directly as well. I hope that helps. That helps tremendously. That Fantastic. is like all the information that I, I wish everybody knew. I certainly have worked with a, a few people with hypersomnia who have successfully used those programs. And it was just an, an enormous relief in each case 
where they were in a terrible bind and the program helped. I've also met people who applied and um, they, they were denied. And then a year later, their circumstances changed, their insurance changes, their income status changes, they reapply. They speak to the person at the patient assistance program and, and it gets um, approved. So don't just try once and then, and then stop. <laughs> Go ahead. And I've also heard people who have insurance and it gets denied from their insurance company and the patient assistance program steps into that gap and helps them through until they can either appeal or if they, they continue to be, um, their appeal continues to be denied, their circumstances change and they have a new insurance company and they can apply to the new company and get it. But having the patient assistance program to fill that gap um, and, and you know, stay, uh, keep on those medications that allow you to keep going every day and, you know, stay at work or, or do whatever you have to do, they can be really critical. Absolutely. And that is, you gave such important advice in your comment that I really want to unpack a few things and stress them. One is people's situations change all the time. Your insurance may change. And as I said before, programs change all the time. We're finding the eligibility um, set, um, criteria expanding a lot more than they have in the past. Um, checking out needy meds regularly because as much as your individual situation may change regarding what type of medication you now need, whether or not you have insurance, um, needy meds programs and what we list change all the time. So thank you. And then the other thing that you also mentioned is in addition to checking this out, or at least it prompted me to think about this, is really exhaust all your options. And check out that healthcare savings tab and reach out to the call center counselors because if you cannot get help through a patient assistance program, there's, there's other ways we can help you. And what that looks like is we can attempt to connect you to another cost savings program. If that doesn't work, we can refer you to a, another partnering organization. And if that doesn't work, at the end of the day, we do have the needy meds drug discount card that I, I view as a safety net. And another great question coming in is whether or not people have to be certified in some way financially to use needy meds. Is it sort of only beneficial to those who may be in financial dire straits? And I love that question because it gives me an opportunity to say an enthusiastic no. So anybody can turn to needy meds. Um, what we really pride ourselves on is the information that we have. And when I say have, I'm talking about through needymeds.org as well as through our call center is not only free to access, but it's anonymous. You don't have to share any of your personal data to get the help you need. And it is applicable to everyone and anyone that is currently in our country that is having difficulty affording their medications or any other healthcare costs. So I think that's really important because in our country, we're finding, and I think a lot of people can agree, there's not really the, the uninsured and the insured now. Now it's a lot of the uninsured, the insured, and the underinsured. The underinsured is a big category of people that they may have some sort of insurance and some sort of drug coverage, but it's just not, not quite meeting their needs, their family's needs, or their patients or clients' needs. So there are no eligibility requirements for needy meds at all. I think it makes sense to look at needy meds just as a resource or a list of ways to save on your healthcare expenses? That's a great question. And I really appreciate the audience being so participatory because it gives me an opportunity to further explain who we are and what we do and help, hopefully help even more people. Absolutely. Well, Carla, it's been great having you. I suspect, thank you for sharing all that information about how to contact Needy Meds. I suspect you're going to be getting a few phone calls and emails and <laughs> website visits from people. And we're going to be posting this video on uh, the Hypersomnia Foundation website, on our insurance uh, website, so that people in the future who are in need and go to our website can see this video, learn about needy meds, and then contact you, you know, years down the road, hopefully. So thank you for giving us a great overview. Thank you so much. It's been my absolute pleasure to be here. Lori, um, in March 2005, uh, was diagnosed with late stage appendix cancer rushed into surgery and given only a few months to live. 
So the chief of oncology said, there's no treatment for your disease. And even if they were, they, the insurance company, won't pay for it. So Lori did her research, found the one curative treatment for her disease, cytoreductive surgery and hypothermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy. Lori's insurer did deny the surgery because it was out of network. So she crafted a 23 page appeal and won in three days. Soon other patients found Lori and asked her to fight their appeals. 16 years later, Lori has fought 232 life-saving appeals, all different diseases and conditions, all different insurers, all over the United States. Lori published two books on how to research, write, and deliver a winning appeal. Her radical approach to fighting the system reframes the traditional way of looking at insurance denials. She is the insurance warrior. Welcome, Lori. Thank you for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> yes. So I've had some really great talks with Lori over the last several months, and I've learned so much about how insurance works and the best ways to appeal. So what we thought we would do for Lori's session today is just continue the fantastic discussion. For the next 30 minutes or so, I'll talk with Lori direct directly, and then we'll have about 15 minutes to answer questions from the audience. So if something occurs to you, go to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type it on in. So let's get started, Lori. So I searched when we were trying to develop these web pages on insurance and disability, I searched far and wide for people who are experts on how to appeal a health insurance company to dial, and you were the only person I could find. I even looked for lawyers who specialize in insurance claims, and I couldn't even find a single one. So please tell us how you came to be the insurance warrior and why you seem to be the only expert on this topic. Well, I'll tell you why there's me, and then I'll tell you why there aren't lawyers. Okay. I didn't go out looking for a job fighting insurance companies. It came and found me. And I was, as you said, I was diagnosed with this stage four cancer. And if I hadn't had a quick learning curve, I would have been gone by 2007. So I took it on. For me, when the insurer denied it, it was like a red flag in front of a bull. Like, oh no, you don't. I'm not gonna sit here and die because my insurance company doesn't wanna pay for it. So uh, nobody thought that I would win my appeal. I had no out of network benefit. They didn't have to pay for it. So when I did win it, it wasn't long before other patients started to find me. And I did everything I could to get out of this. It's a ton of work, but it took me about a year and a half to really accept and realize that this is what I do. And the way I do it is that it's not really about fighting insurance companies. If it were, I wouldn't spend one minute of my precious time on it. It's about giving people their power back so that they aren't the little guy anymore. They're the big guy. And I have a lot of different ways of doing that. So why no lawyers? You know, I've written many appeals for lawyers. When a lawyer comes down with some god awful disease and gets denied a treatment, they come and Google and find me. The reason there are no lawyers is twofold. First, it's too much work and there's no money in it. Second, insurance companies are well armed against lawyers nowadays. They have a hundred lawyers to your one lawyer, a hundred high powered lawyers. They will keep you in the courts for years. And if a lawyer actually took a denial of care case and won it, there are no damages. All the insurer will pay is what they should have paid for it in the first place. So who's gonna pay that lawyer for working for years? So bottom line is lawyers have no power over the insurance company. And that's a good thing because you, the patient, are the one that actually has leverage over the insurance company. Okay, and you're gonna tell me a bit more about how we get that leverage. I sure am. <laughs> okay. So now all these people have found you and you've helped hundreds of people. So you're this expert, but for each one of your helpies, it's their first time through the fire. So do you have any words of wisdom for people um, that are getting ready to go through this experience and how do they think about uh, this journey they're starting? I do. And there's a lot of personal advice too, because it's really me reaching out a hand 
to people who are going through the same scary woods that I went through. But what I tell them about appeals is no appeal was ever meant to lead to an approval. This is not a good faith process. You think you're playing a game with certain assumptions and certain rules? Well, guess what? All of your assumptions are misconceptions and there are no rules. So if no appeal was meant to lead to an approval and you do exactly what the insurance plan tells you to do, you're sort of, you're going down the garden path and eventually you're gonna wind up with another denial and then you're done. So how do we win an appeal if it's not meant to lead to an approval? My idea is first, you become very familiar with all the insurance company's procedures and then do exactly the opposite. I'll give you one example that I like. Almost every insurance company wants you to send your appeal to the post office box appeals department. It's always a post office box. Quiz question, why is it always a post office box? Because you can't call a post office box on the phone. You can't complain to a post office box. You can't march up and down in front of the post office box with a sign. There's no access and there's no accountability. So what's the opposite? Well, you will send it to the post office box, but you will also deliver it to the desk of the CEO of the parent company of the insurance company and 19 other top executives, decision makers at the insurance plan with a few outside eyes to keep them honest. That's the opposite of the post office box. Real live people. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be your job to go and find them. And I guess we'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay. So when somebody receives um, a denial letter for a medication that we, that have IH need to function every day, it can mm -hmm. feel extremely scary because yes. you're going up against what, what feels like this huge insurance company. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons it's scary is because we don't know the appeal process and what happens at the insurance company when we submit an appeal. So who is making the decisions and how do they make the decisions and how do you set it up so the little guy can win when it feels like you're up, up against this big powerful company? Well, I'm gonna tell you that never in a million years will any insurance company ever tell you who is making these decisions. Okay. There's a reason for that. Does anybody there really want to talk to 57,000 disgruntled insured people who've been denied? You know, you'll find when you start looking for them that the insurance executives and higher ups, they're hiding from us. They don't want to, have, they don't want to talk to us. However, when I take a case, the first thing I do is I will build an addressee list for the insurance plan. In other words, I'm Googling, I'm searching, I'm building a list of I don't go up below vice president level or so, uh, CEO of the parent company, chief medical officer, uh, some executive vice presidents of healthcare management and on and on. And it takes a couple of days. It's that important. But if you hit all the top executives with your appeal, either they could sign off on that and reverse it or they know who can. And once you send it to all these people, you also get a synergistic effect. They start calling each other. And of course, later on, I'll tell you, you're gonna be calling them too. But you get the hive buzzing here and before you know it, it's approved. I don't know who makes these decisions. I have a reasonably good idea because of all these cases, but you don't really have to know. Now, um, how do I make the little guy into a big guy? And it's what I just told you. If we can find the names, titles, email addresses, and as many personal office phone numbers as we can for these people, we suddenly become a VIP. They're calling you back. And there's another really important reason why we are the big guy. You know, insurance appeals are not about, you think it's about if I tell them that I need the treatment or the drug and my doctor tells them I need the drug, then surely they will approve it. But it's not about that. What it's about is the only question any insurer cares about when deciding whether to cover something is, 
are we required to pay for this per the terms of your contract? Guess what? You're the one who holds the contract. And there's an unspoken contract that I'm always keeping in my mind. And that's my part of the contract is that I pay my premiums every month. And their part of the contract is they will provide the most effective treatment for my disease or condition. And I'm gonna hold them to it. So insurers aren't afraid of doctors because if the doctor is in network, uh, he's bound to them by contract. They're not afraid of lawyers. But what they are afraid of is a well-armed, reasonable, calm, collected, educated patient who knows who to send the appeal to. Terrifying. We are the big guy already. All right. So, okay. So what, now you've, you've made this appeal. We haven't talked about what's in your appeal that makes it different and so powerful. So it must be doing something different if you're winning almost every appeal. So can you tell us about some of the secrets about what you put in the appeal that you are sending to these senior leaders of the insurance company? I can, and it's sort of an overwhelming question for me. It's like yeah. asking Julia, Ch I've published two books about how to research and write and deliver the winning appeals. Sort of like asking Julia, Ch what makes your food so tasty? Okay. But I'll give you a nutshell, nutshell version. First of all, I've already said it, but access is power. So who you send it to is more important than what you say in the appeal. If you write a, like a, a kind of a crappy two-page snivelgram and send it to a carefully curated list of 20 top decision makers, you might win. But if you write a 32-page magnificent, meticulously researched paper and send it to the PO box, you'll probably lose. So it's that important. But I put everything in these appeals. You know, I never know what's going to ring their chimes. Uh, I could say I put a lot of science in these appeals, not because insurers care about science, but because they can't ignore science. And does that mean I attach scientific articles to my appeals? No, never. Why? Quiz question. Why don't I attach articles? Because they're not going to read them? Ding, 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 ding. Okay. Yeah, they're not going to take the trouble. They, they don't want to pay for it. So what I do is, uh, it was about 2009 when I figured this part out. I read all the articles myself. Now, don't be scared. You know, you may be able to just read the abstract of the article, the little abbreviated version, and that'll be all you need. But I read them myself as best I can. And then I quote them in the body of the appeal. So they can't get away from it. And what I found is that when I read some of these scientific articles, I'm I'm much better at talking about the treatment. I know more about it. I'm more sure on my feet when I'm writing the appeal. Um, I always include something nobody else includes, which is, I call it the bad medical story. And that's, I will interview the person and find out everything that happened with this disease or condition, uh, what the doctor said, what he did, a lot of dialogue, because that brings a story to life. So why, why am I telling all this? They have your medical records. I'm telling it for a purpose, you know? An appeal is a strategy game, and this is one part of the strategy. I tell the bad medical story in such a way that when they get to the end of it, I want them to think, oh my gosh, maybe you ought to just pay for this. That's why I call it the bad story. You wanna make it sound as bad as possible, but don't complain about it. That's the other thing that makes my appeals powerful. Uh, there's no emotion in my appeals. And by that, I mean no bold, no underline, no exclamation points, no all caps, no how dare you, no I'm going to die if I, because everybody does that. It doesn't work. Much more effective to take a calm, uh, reasonable tone. It's a strategy game, like chess. And you don't win the chess match by grabbing the board and whacking him over the head with it. You know, you win it by knowing your worthy opponent and staying two or three steps ahead of them. I treat it as a strategy game. There's no emotion, lots of science, bad medical story, and um, a whole lot of other things. <laughs> okay, and it's, and it's in the books, right? Yes, yes it's all there. Okay, um, 
um, you and I talked some in the past about how the number of appeals that you get has been changing over the past several years. So how many appeals are there now and what can we expect? Okay, people often contact me and say, how many appeals do I get? And I say, I don't know. What you need to do is all the information about your plan processes, it's in your benefits book. So if you're gonna need to appeal, the first thing you need to do is look at your benefits book. And there'll be a section called appeals and grievances, and it will tell you how many appeals you get and how long they give themselves to decide the appeal and all that sort of stuff. But I can tell you how it's changed over the last 16 years. Uh, back in the day, people often got like two levels of appeal within the insurance company. And then a lot of times they actually got a hearing, either a telephone or an in-person hearing. And when people got a hearing, you know, I write them a speech and I teach them how to like control that hearing. But, uh, and then sometimes they got an external review. So how I've seen that change is that, guess how many uh, internal appeals you probably get now? One. I mean, they don't really like plan to pay for it. So why do all these extraneous levels and hearings and whatnot? So to me, what that means is that you don't just want to sit down and start writing and send your thing to the PO box. If you've got one, level of appeal. You, you really want to make it good. You want to prepare, you want to study and research and just polish that thing as much as you can. Now, I also really need to tell people, you don't have to do everything I do. I'm obsessed. I'm obsessed because I was the patient and because I nearly died and because nobody knows how to do this. But if you do one tenth of what I do, one one hundredth of what I do, you'll be ever so much more likely to win your appeal. All right. So um, when somebody is preparing appeal, is it best to get your doctor to write the appeal? And will the insurance company be more um, liable to listen to him or her? Or should the patient be writing the appeal? How does that happen? Well, the first thing most people do when they get denied is call the doctor's office. Mm -hmm. My doctor will win my appeal. Uh, don't do that. <laughs> Just don't do it. And the reason why not to do it is because doctors don't win appeals. Most of the cases that I get are after the doctor lost all the appeals. And then they come Google and find me because my doctor lost all my appeals. It's not a good faith process. You know, so there's a lot of reasons why doctors don't win appeals. But the main thing is that they are, if the doctor is in network, he's bound by contract to the insurance company. And therefore, the insurance company can reward him, they can punish him, and worst case scenario, they could cancel his contract, and then he won't have any patients. Is he ideally suited to fight the insurance company? You know, it's not 1960 anymore. You know, back in the 60s, uh, a doctor was separate from the insurance company, and therefore, he could fight the insurance company on your behalf. But in about 1970 or so, the insurance companies put their heads together, I don't know how it happened, and came up with the most diabolical instrument of control that you can imagine, networks. Now they said to the young doctor right out of school, he has big student debt and he needs to build a practice and he doesn't have to do that. Just sign, sign here. And you'll have an automatic clientele no matter what you do. Because we make these patients they can only go to doctors who are in the network. Like, yay. But now he's bound by contract to them. He's in no position to fight them. So I, I guess maybe the bad news, but don't, don't waste too much time letting the doctor lose your appeals. You're gonna, I, where I'm going with this is you're gonna need to take it on yourself. Well, um, and then uh, there could be an issue if the doctor does do an appeal and then the insurance company tells the patient that they can no longer appeal. So can you talk about how patients should be uh, aware of how to preserve their right to appeal, even if the doctor is participating in the process? Well, this is something I've just seen recently. It's a kind of a recent development. I call it trying to steal your appeal. You know, you have your appeal rights as the patient, the insured person, and the doctor has his appeal rights. And so 
in, in reality, the doctor can do all the appeals he wants and he can lose all the appeals he wants if you wanna go through that. And then you can have your appeal. And the only way the doctor can use up your appeal is if you signed a paper designating the doctor as your official designated representative then you've signed away your rights. But what I've seen in the past six months or so is someone will contact me and say, I've lost all my appeals, can you help me? And I'll say, well, you know, when did you file your appeal and what happened? And well, I didn't file any appeals. And I said, what? And they say, well, the doctor used up all my appeals. And I'll say, did you sign a paper giving your appeal rights to the doctor? I said, no. I said, well, then you're gonna file an appeal. If they try to steal your appeal like that, then you just, I'm very early in the appeal, you say, this is my first level appeal. You know, I've not signed away my rights, not signed it over to the doctor, therefore here I go, I'm submitting my appeal. Okay, so yeah. don't, don't sign the paper. <laughs> don't sign the paper, and if they say the doctor used up your appeals, ignore it. The answer go is ahead no, with your appeal. file an appeal. Okay, yeah. so, where you know we have a lot of people with idiopathic hypersomnia on the call today some with narcolepsy um but while people with narcolepsy have medications that are fda approved those with idiopathic hypersomnia have zero fda approved medications so what we're usually prescribed are narcolepsy medications that are prescribed off label for idiopathic hypersomnia so the insurance companies come back and say, well, that medication isn't approved for IH, so therefore we can't cover it. So how do you make an argument to fight that claim? Well, there's several different ways and you'll, your folks will probably think of brand new ways. However, there's nothing, I think that insurance companies like to use that denial reason, not FDA approved for this indication because people get hung up on it. They think, oh, well, it's not approved, what am I gonna do? Here's the thing, there's nothing wrong with off-label use. It's not illegal or immoral or improper or anything. If you go on the FDA website and search around on off-label or off-label use, you'll find some verbiage saying, we encourage off-label use. As long as the doctor is qualified to treat the condition and he keeps a record of how he used the drug, it's encouraged. Over 70% of all cancer medications prescribed by oncologists and approved by insurance, they're all off-label. It's just a non-issue that becomes a stumbling block. So I think we can shift our paradigm on that. It's just a non-issue, but I'll give you an example. Uh, when I first, first started doing some appeals for um, deep brain stimulation for severe Tourette syndrome, and the first appeal I did, the denial said, uh, deep brain stimulation is approved for Parkinson's and other tremor disease conditions, but not, it's off, it's not for Tourette's. So I'm thinking, hmm, how am I, what am I gonna do with that? That was the first time I'd encountered it. So I was interviewing the mom, it was a teenager, getting all the bad medical story. And she said, he was diagnosed at nine years old and he's been treated with 19 different prescription medications over the years. And uh, she talked about the horrible side effects and the god awful this and that. I said, wait a minute, I want a list of all 19 medications right now. So she sent me the list and I took it and I looked up the FDA label for every one of those 19 medications and none of them were FDA approved for Tourette's. Hello? So in the appeal, I said something like, Anthem Blue Cross cannot have it both ways. For the past 13 years, they've been providing and covering off-label treatments for this patient. So get clever, get creative. There are ways to do it, but there is nothing wrong with off-label use. Okay. So another denial reason that we commonly see is not medically necessary. <laughs> so what does it mean? When an insurance company says not medically necessary and any good examples of how you've kind of uh, fought back against that one? Oh, absolutely. That's like a super pet peeve. You know, okay. there's, a, there's a whole <laughs> world of deception built into this phrase, not medically necessary. It's like people, it's, it doesn't mean what you think it means. 
And if you're going to prove that a treatment is medically necessary, you have to know what it means. So people believe, even doctors, patients and doctors all fall into this booby trap. Uh, uh, you think it means, well, it's medically necessary. That means clinically appropriate, right? In other words, I need it to be, treat my condition. Uh, or my doctor says I need it. Now, my doctor says I need it. Therefore, it's medically necessary, right? Well, it doesn't mean any of that. It's not a medical term. It's not a clinical term. It's a legal term. And when you see in your denial letter that it says not medically necessary, what that means to the insurance company is it's not a covered benefit. There's no clinical piece for them. So what does it mean? So easy. Go in your benefits book, which is your favorite book now, and go to the section called definitions and scrolling on down, medical necessity. And you'll see a big, long definition. It's meant to be very intimidating if you ever find it, right? So you'll see section A, B, C, D, E, F, G, print it, study it. And then what you're gonna do is you simply quote the entire definition in your appeal and you prove point by point that your drug meets their requirement to be considered medically necessary. And the title of this section of your appeal is XYZ drug is medically necessary per plan definition. Wow, so you're essentially using the language Fair of word. the contract against them. Always. And that's, that's what we're coming to is that when I said this is a contractual dispute, yes. we don't win appeals using our words. People think, oh, I speak English, I can write an appeal. And they write the two page snivel gram, but I really need it and all this, all this, all this. And uh, uh, it just isn't about any of that. You have to take, they don't, they can dismiss our words. They can ignore our words. They can sweep our words under the carpet, but they can't ignore their own words. They, insurance companies put out so many words. I absolutely love it. There's always something to take issue with. <laughs> okay. And it's the same thing, by the way, if a treatment is, is uh, uh, denied as experimental, exact same template. You go to the definitions, look up their definition of experimental slash investigational, do your whole same thing with proving each point. Okay. Oh, well, I guess we got busted on that. Now, another thing and another way that my appeals are powerful that people don't do is it's powerful contractually if you can prove that they've paid for E4. That's what we call precedent. Now, my own, uh, my own life-saving treatment, the cytoreductive surgery and hyperthermic interperitoneal chemo, that's my kind of like my home issue. And so I'm the keeper of the precedent. Nobody pays me for that, but I've got 382 cases where insurance companies have paid for mostly out of network. I've got them arranged chronologically and by insurance company. And if I do an appeal for someone say with Kaiser, I can just rearrange it and say, Kaiser has already paid for this 23 times, hello. So I would challenge you to, um, with your group to have some, somebody be the keeper of the precedent. So we Everything, have had, you know, yeah, knowledge, is, knowledge is power, go ahead. I'm aware of two people in the hypersomnia community who read your book and developed appeals to get approval for a medication. And they did do the step to develop precedent by going out to Facebook support groups and right. saying, has anybody had an insurance company cover this medication? And, exactly. and that's one of the ways. willing to do it. And that's that one of the ways. And it isn't powerful. just people, it isn't just people who win appeals. You're looking for anybody who had it paid for, for any reason. And, mm -hmm. um, over time, it's something that you build brick by brick, you know what I mean? As more people come on the group and they say, I got it approved, and then you go catch them. The, the difference that I would, I would say though, is that I want all the information in there. I want their first name, their last name, name of the drug, when it was approved, and the name of the doctor. None of these anonymous precedent, because it's not powerful. You need their names in there. It's like the names list, you know, like 9-11, the names. And so, why do people want to anonymize these precedent cases? Probably they might be like scared of medical privacy, like HIPAA, this or that, and maybe we can't use these names in our appeals. But I would say, first of all, I mean, I'm not, we're not, patients aren't HIPAA covered entities. 
we probably could just use people's names. But what I do as keeper of precedent, I have a little one page release form, like a HIPAA release form. I say, I agree to uh, have my, my information used in appeals for this treatment. And you keep them in a big file, but precedent is so powerful. They really hate it. You know? Yeah, exactly. To say you've already paid for this exact drug for this. I know, we're busted. You know, before. You know, insurance companies were the most uh, powerful proponents of the medical privacy regulations. And they will tell you, it's because we love you. We want to preserve your medical privacy. It's because they don't want you to find out that they paid for it before. Right. Because right. I'm opening people's eyes. You know, I think my two jobs in life, I would say it would be my mission, would be to dispel misconceptions and to give you your power back. Okay. So we've talked a little bit about the arguments and what goes in the appeal, but there's more information in, in the book about exactly how to do this, right? Oh, it's a 350 page book, but remember, just take yeah. what you need and leave the rest. Leave the rest. So I think one of the tricky parts is this finding information about the senior executives and who to send the appeal to. Do you have any just tricks of the trade that um, you've learned over time that, you know, little corners to look in. <laughs> to find little, rocks, you know, little rocks to lift up. Little rocks to lift up, yeah. Well, once again, you know, it's like the Julia Child analogy because it's an art and a science to find somebody who's hiding from you. You know, I call it, my, I put on my Sherlock Holmes hat, but yeah. I can give you a few tidbits. How about that? Okay. Let's say, and, and the most important thing in finding higher ups is relentlessness. People are always contacting me and saying, well, I'm doing my appeal, but I just couldn't find any, only two executives and I couldn't find their email. I said, then you didn't look hard enough. Relentlessness. I will literally spend three hours on one phone number if it's a really important one. Access is power. So let's say you have um, Acme Insurance. That's the name of your insurance company. Well, the, Bare bottom where I would start would be, I would type in, it's a lot about all about Googling. I would type in Acme Insurance Leadership Team, Aetna Leadership Team, Cigna Leadership Team, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts Leadership Team. It's just this beginning point. And their website will come up and you'll see a few names and titles of top executives. And most important one, you know, you'll see the CEO of the parent company, and then you'll see maybe a, a executive vice president of human resources or finance or aha, chief medical officer. Aha, executive vice president of healthcare management. And in the book, I, I give a huge list of titles you wanna be looking for. Okay. So now you've got a few names, but not a lot of names, maybe three or four. Now you go to, now you type in, so you have John Smith is the CEO. Now you type in John Smith, Acme, LinkedIn. And all of a sudden you're on LinkedIn. And there's John Smith. And then there's a column on the right-hand side where they're listing other people that work there. Pretty much on his level. LinkedIn is like my gold mine of finding because they're trying to hide. And sometimes and you have to also sift through and see which ones might actually have something to do with this. Because you don't want to be sending, you want to send it to the right people, but not to the wrong people. Otherwise you look like kind of a chump, you know. And so like the uh, executive VP of sales, you know, he probably doesn't have anything to do with it. But uh, so you start doing that. And now I'm gonna look for their email addresses because I'm gonna email it to all these people uh, on a Sunday. And so the good news about that is that most corporations configure all their email addresses the same way. So just find one. One's gonna be out there on some press release or somewhere, some email of one person who works there. And then I'm going to take my list of executives and I'm going to try them out. I'm going to go, John, like say it's first name dot last name at acme.com. Then I'll go over to an, another one of my emails and I'll go john.smith at acme.com. I'll send them a little test email with one word in it. I'll send test emails to all of them. And if they don't bounce back, that's their email. So that's quite easy. The challenge, most challenging part of all is the phone numbers. Yeah, because boy, they really don't want you to call them. Yeah, sixteen years ago, it used to be uh, like a turkey shoot out there. You know, there were these lists of 
of high executives and their fax numbers and their phone numbers. Well, they wised up to that. So um, one of my ways to start finding phone numbers is uh, there's a headquarters, right? Like the headquarters of United Healthcare is in Minnesota or the headquarters of, uh, you know, whichever Aetna is in Connecticut. So you go to the headquarters and you look for their phone number. You want their local phone number, the area code and the first three digits. So now you've got the headquarters, area code and first three digits. So then I'm gonna go John Smith, Acne, area code, first three digits, dash. And I've put in so much that sometimes it'll give me the rest of his phone number. That's a good I find, trick. I find phone numbers everywhere you can think of. I find it on uh, state insurance investigations. I find it on federal tax forms. You know, just be open to Googling everything and going through a few pages of search results. But that brings me to the power, what's powerful about my appeals. I do something that people don't do. What we do is, you know, we write the appeal. We're gonna email it out like a giant email blast to all these executives and a few outside eyes to keep them honest on the Sunday, kind of sneak up on them there. So it's the first thing on their desk on Monday morning. And then on Monday morning begins the telephone approach. We're gonna start calling them. And people don't call them. If you just send it to them and let them have their way with it, it's not gonna happen as fast as you need it to happen and it may not happen at all. So that's why we went through all that trouble looking for these phone numbers. So I coach them when I'm doing the case and they call them on the Monday morning and I'm waiting, you know, here, I say, hi, so-and-so here. Just calling to see if you've received my urgent expedited appeal. You have? Tell me, how's it coming along? Pretty soon they're talking to each other. Things are happening. And then there's a second round of calls later in the day and say, hi, just checking in. Tell me, when can we expect a decision on that? You're making sure they got it. You're making sure they're gonna read it. And then you're pressing them very politely for a decision. And I have tons of telephone strategies because guess what? Insurance companies have tons of telephone strategies. I mean, have you ever called an insurance company? They have telephone strategies. Strategy number one is not to give you their last name. That way you can't uh, figure out their email address. They won't give you their phone number. Uh, they say, oh, why, why don't you give me your phone number and we'll call you back. And people are so excited, like they're gonna call me. And they're sitting around waiting and they never, ever, ever call. So I tell my pe folks, I say, listen, when they say, give me your phone, I say, you know what? I'm going to be in and out today. How about if I check back with you a little later? But you don't tell them when you're going to, when exactly you're going to check back, because why? Quiz question. <laughs> you, you, go ahead. Because they'll not pick up the phone. <laughs> they'll be on voicemail. Yeah. So yeah. It's, it's, once again, it's, it's, the, it's the end game. It's the strategy game. And yeah. speed is a strategy. So the phones are partly about access and they're partly about speed. Because the faster you can get a decision, the more likely you will win. So it's an all-encompassing strategy from, from beginning to end. So Lori, I have one more thing I want to ask you, and then I'd love to get to the audience questions. Yeah. So um, the last thing I really wanted to bring up was we've talked a lot about uh, prescription medications for IH because that's a pretty common issue for us. But, you know, everybody in our audience is dealing with all sorts of different health issues or other health issues and other members of their family. And so I know that kind of one of the uh, key strategies you have developed is what to do about denials for out of network doctors. For those people that are out there that may be facing issues that aren't medication related, but it's dealing with this denial for out of network doctors. Um, are there any kind of words of wisdom you have for those cases? Sure. I mean, most of the appeals that I do nowadays are for network issues. In other words, getting out of network or out of state or whatever uh, treatment's covered. Uh, so um, it, it is something I do all the time. And my mission really is to make complicated things simple. And so insurance companies really only deny things for the same three reasons, no matter what it is. Either it's experimental, it's not medically necessary, or it's out of network. Or in your cases, uh, it's not on the formulary, that's the other one. 
So in network, out of network appeals. What you have to do, you've got your expert, doctor, surgeon, whomever over here, he's out of network. And by the way, most super ultra top tier high expert surgeons probably aren't gonna be in network for your insurance company. They may not be local and they probably aren't in network. And then over here, you have the insurance company wants you to go to their in network offering. So first you have to do your research as always, and you have to set up the proof. You have to find the proof that your expert, your out of network doctor walks on water. You wanna prove in your appeal how expert he is. You wanna list out all the scientific articles he's published around this. Let's not, if he published his out, good outcomes, you quote those, you know, survival rates, all this sort of thing. His, this is all he does. Uh, uh, he's been doing this for 27 years. You know, everything you can say uh, to prove he he's, he's walks on water. Then what about the in-network ones? Either you prove that there is no one in the network to offer this treatment, but usually there are some. And so what you have to prove is that the same treatment is not available in the network. So you have to find out who they're gonna send you to, a list, and then you have to prove the opposite of them. They're uh, inexperienced, unqualified, uninterested. This is only a sideline for them. They published uh, uh, one article and it was about uh, mice getting the flu. You know, you just portray them as being just incredibly so unqualified and inexperienced that they're probably a little dangerous. Compare and contrast. So that's the added thing that you put in a, in a network appeal. Okay, super. Um, we have a couple of questions that are in, so let's switch. Um, uh, one question is, who are outside eyes? So you mentioned you have- Oh, you that's, these, I love that question. Yeah, Thank who are you. outside eyes that help keep this, you know, help keep the insurance executives on their toes? <laughs> oh, that's just such a great question. Um, I like to make complicated things simple and I don't have a lot of time. So my favorite outside eyes are a member of their board of directors. Because if people who are on the board of directors, board members for insurance company, they get paid a lot of money. If they're on that board, they know somebody high up. You know, they, they play golf with John Smith, the CEO. However, they don't work there. And so um, it's pretty, usually pretty easy to find a list of board members. And so you could do like your ACME insurance. You go ACME board of directors. It may not be that easy, but you just go looking for the board of directors or board members. And then I pick and choose, I call it going shopping. Like I want ones that might actually pick up the phone and call somebody over there. So maybe like a public interest attorney or some kind of do-gooder or, I kind of like academics, presidents of universities, because they're going to like my appeal and they might be reasonable. All I want them to do and all I ask them to do is if you would just pick up the phone, it can make all the difference. That's what I say in the cover email, because it would. So my fa those are my favorite outside eyes. That's the easy, and some, easy part. And sometimes those outside eyes do pick up the phone, huh? They really do. And that's why I do it. And even if they don't pick up the phone, guess what? I don't always uh, put names on the cover sheet of my appeals because I think they're gonna really do anything. Sometimes I just put them on there for intimidation factor. Yeah. Like if it's a really important member of their board of directors, someone who used to be the governor and the senator and all this kind of stuff. Sometimes I'll just put them on there. I don't really even care if they call them. I just want the people to see them. Okay. Like somebody other than us is looking at it. Right, exactly. <laughs> All right, somebody else um, lost an appeal, but then wrote to their state insurance commission and the state insurance commission stepped in and essentially overruled the insurance company. So are, have you ever used that option? Are you familiar with that? Well, it's an option that everybody believes is, is a good one. Mm -hmm. Well, oh, the insurance commissioner will help me. And the person was very fortunate and I'm sure they approached him in just the right way, but over all these appeals and all these people I've given free advice to, for the most part, insurance commissioners have no power over insurance companies. You know, I have a recent case and I did put the insurance commissioner on there, which I don't usually do because they just aren't any help. But somebody at the insurance commissioner's office got interested in it, right? Wanted to run with it and help her. And so um, she said, oh, send me all your information and send me this and send me, and I'm gonna file, a, we're gonna file a complaint and we're gonna go, and my helpie said, 
what if they don't provide all this stuff you've asked for? What if they don't do it? What if they just ignore you? And she said, um, well, there's a $500 fine. Well, of course, they, they ignored it. And many, it, it depends on the state too, because each state is like a different country when it comes to insurance regulations and insurance commissioners. But a number of them just got done being an executive with an insurance company. Oh, they should okay. have a law against that. So I've, I've <laughs> hardly ever gotten any help from them, but uh, you could call them on the phone. I wouldn't put a lot of energy into it. Okay. So um, we have one, one last question. Somebody would like to know, are there any key words or phrases that you can use during an appeal that? Well, my appeals are 30 plus pages long, you know? Okay. I have so a ton a of, well, let, me, let me try and think if any special phrases come to mind. Um, mm -hmm. uh, well, like in the cover letter, for example, I'll always put in a sentence like, like say the, it's an employer-based plan. And uh, so the employer's mixed up in the decision and the insurance company's mixed up in it. We don't know how the employer's mixed and, and then the person. And so I'll put a sentence right towards the end of it and I'll say, I'm sure that um, Jones Widget Company, Acme Insurance and I all have the same goal, the most effective treatment for me. You put word, every word in my appeals is strategic. You know, there are also what I call medical Medical, medical necessity is a whole um, body of law. That's how deceptive it is. So I actually have a list of medical necessity words and I toss those in now and then for seasoning, you know, like um, careless, that's a legal word. You're supposed to take care with these decisions. Careless, um, ambiguous, um, uh, I could go on and on, you know. <laughs> okay, is there information about some of these words and, the and phrases in your book? Absolutely. What I have in the book, too, is like a sample of every page, every section, like the bad medical story, the precedent list, what it looks like, how you put science in there. And I have actual samples of what they look like. And then Wonderful. I explain what's on the page. OK, super. And just so everybody knows out there, the Hypersomnia Foundation webpage, our new insurance and disability web pages, we have one specifically on insurance denials and appeals. So, and on that, uh, the insurance denials and appeals page are a couple of example letters for, there, there were appeal letters that were written by people that had read Lori's book and were using um, her strategies and many of these suggested phrases, et cetera, to develop the appeal. And by the way, both appeals were successful. <laughs> so we put that out there for everybody to be able to take a look at and uh, be able to you know, copy and paste relevant parts of these appeals into your own appeal if that will help you. And if folks want to contact me, they can contact me through my website. It's got a contact form and yes. it's uh, the, so, theinsurancewarrior.com. Yes, near the top of the insurance uh, denials and appeals page is a whole section on Lori, a picture of her book, a connection to her website. And if you go to her website, um, there, she has lots of uh, information and little uh, videos and everything that's there. So it's just a wonderful resource. Uh, listen, Lori, I've so enjoyed getting to know you and learned so much along the way. I really appreciate um, you coming on today and, and sharing your stories and your strategy with us. Well, thank you for trusting me to share this story. And, uh, and I, I'd, I'd like to continue to help however I can. Okay, wonderful. So that's about all we have time for today. Um, thank you to both Carla and Lori again. Um, we really have come to the end of our time together. And I thank everybody who wrote in some questions. Um, so in just a moment, a short survey will on today's program will pop up on your screen. And we'd really appreciate it if you would take a few minutes to fill it out. On behalf of the Hypersomnia Foundation, our thanks to all of you for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day.